everybody. Um, we're very lucky to have with us uh, today Joe Agnello. Joe's um, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the CBS Corporation, and more importantly, he's a proud alumnus of Pace University. Um, he's a member of our Board of Trustees, and those of you who go to Pace may recognize the name Ionello because our field house that's being built right now on the Pleasantville campus is named for Joe Ionello. Um, so it will come to a surprise that he was a very involved student athlete while he attended Pace. He's a he was a member of Alpha Chi Epsilon fraternity. He graduated from Lubin in 1990 with a degree in business administration and then got his MBA from Columbia University. His education clearly positioned him for the successful career he's had in business. He spent seven years at KPMG before moving to CPS in 19, CBS in 1997, two years before it merged with Viacom. Joe then held a variety of financial positions at Viacom, steadily moving up the ranks, and he was instrumental in the process of separating CBS from Viacom at the end of 2005. He then went on to become a key part of the management team at CBS, first as Senior Vice President, Chief Development Officer and Treasurer, then as Deputy Chief Financial Officer, and then he was promoted to Chief Financial Officer in 2009. And he was named to his current post of Chief Operating Officer in 2013. In this role, he continues to oversee all the financial aspects of CBS, but in addition, he oversees CBS's strategies for selling its content across all platforms. As we all know, the world of media consumption is changing faster than it ever has, so it's a great time to have Joe Ionella with us. Please welcome him to the stage. So Joe, I thought, um, in the time we have, um, before we talk about the business, I know many college students have a hard time visualizing how you go from being a football player on the Pleasantville campus of Pace University to chief operating officer of a major media and entertainment company. Tell us your story. And that's what sports will do for you. Uh, you know, I, I certainly, when I, when I you know, uh, entered Pace, I certainly had no idea that I would really be sitting you know, in this chair. So it's okay if you don't have life figured out as you're out there saying, you know, I don't know what direction I want to go, and I think that's okay. I think you'll find your way, you know, as you go. But along the way, there's definitely, you know, disappointments when, you know, I always say in sports, whatever level you are, at some point in your life, you're going to hear the word no. Whether, you know, you're just not that good and you're not good enough to get to the next level and or you're, you're at the top of the game and where you're going to have to retire and, the, you know, the manager's got to kind of tap you on the shoulder and say, um, you know, that's it. And so, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned in sports, I think. Um, you know, that translate into business. So that, that kind of background certainly has helped me. Um, because, you know, as you sit there, again, as the chief operating officer, you don't, you don't make decisions by yourself in your office with nobody else. There's always people around you. There's always a team. So what you have to do is you got to figure out how to work within teams. And sometimes you lead, and sometimes you follow. Sometimes you listen, and sometimes you speak. And I think, again, sports, again, particularly team sports, really kind of instills that into people. It's like sometimes, again, you come in as a freshman, at the, but then you have to, you know, become that leader and evolve and, you know, earn the respect of your colleagues. And I think that's very important. So I think that's kind of helped me as I navigated. But, you know, if I was being honest, I was like, I, I have no idea that I, you know, I'd be sitting here. So did it help you when you became an accountant? <laughs> look, it, you know, look, again, accountant, I, I I navigated there because, I, I, again, I was, you know, somebody said I, I was good in math and that seemed like a natural fit. I, I kind of like to figure things out. I'm very analytical. So that kind of was just a natural. But, you know, when I, w when I went into public accounting, it just, it wasn't enough for me. It's a, per it's a, it's a wonderful career. You know, partners in, uh, at accounting firms have, have fantastic lives and that is, uh, th th that's something to aspire to for sure. But for me, that just wasn't, it didn't get me up in the morning. And I said, I have to kind of find what gets me up in the morning. And, you know, along the way, you, you still have to make money because you still have to live and you got to earn. And so I was kind of finding my way, you know, through that. But it, it gave me the ability, public accounting gave me the ability to see different companies. I saw financial services. I saw manufacturing companies. I saw, you know, entertainment companies. And that kind of gave me that, that said, well, I definitely don't like this. This is that, ah, but I really have a passion for this. And that's what really allowed me to see that kind of scope. So how did it, how did it come about that you made the transition to, to Viacom? To Viacom? Well, well, well it, it was a merger, but at CBS, when I went over there, basically I, I went back to business school. I, I got my MBA from Columbia. Um, 
and a friend of mine had just um, went to uh, CBS because CBS is a company called Westinghouse, for those of you who don't remember. They bought, it was an industrial company, you know, makes elevators, you know, power generation, things like that, and they just purchased CBS. This is um, at the end of 1995. And, you know, uh, a lot of my friends were going into investment banking and doing that sort of thing. And he said, hey, you know, they're kind of buying and selling all of these companies. Why don't you try to do it from the inside? Um, I'll get you an interview with the CFO and see where it goes. And, you know, kind of it went from there. And, you know, although the company has changed, they said merge with Viacom separated, I really only interviewed twice in my life, once at KPMG and once at CBS, mm -hmm. graduating from Pace. That was really the only time that I ever sat inter being interviewed. I spent a lot of time, a lot of people interviewing people, but um, so uh, and so I just kind of went, you know, up up the ranks through from there. So, when you reflect about your life, as we do, mm -hmm. um, what what do you think the personal qualities uh, that you bring to the table are that have helped propel you to the levels you're at? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always something you wrestle with, and you're saying like, you know, even just being asked that question, I was like, I have to really just reflect and say, you know, kind of why me and stuff like that, and could could it have been somebody else in there? And and sure, but you know, I really don't believe in luck. I believe in that old you know adage that you know, luck equals when when opportunity meets preparedness. As far as I was concerned, is I just needed the opportunity. I needed somebody to tap me on the shoulder, said, I'm going to give this kid a chance. And, you know, really, Les Moonves did that for me. And so I was ready. And I, I, I used the thing, and it's a sports analogy. I, I have that attitude. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I'm prepared. I studied everything. So I always knew I had to be one step ahead of that management team. Because if you become the go-to person, if you have the answer, you know, to these problems, you're going to get the, you're going to get the call the second time. You know, and I always just say, it's like, you got to have a good attitude about it. You know, there's some people who sometimes it's just always, you know, when you deal with them, there's just drama around them. And then there's some people who just get stuff done. I was one of those guys who just get it done. I don't need about any of this other stuff. It's the cream rises to the top. Just put your head down, get it done, have a smile on your face, and you'll get that phone call again and again and again. And then that opportunity is going to come knocking. And that's when you're going to get put into the game. And then what you do from that, you know, from there is really up to you. You and I were talking a little bit about the difference between corporate cultures at different entertainment companies. Yeah. I mean, it's true at accounting firms. It's true at, yeah. I mean, firms are not homogeneous. Yes. They're, they're all very different based yeah. on the people who are there and who they attract. Talk a little bit about the culture at CBS and, and how you see your role in that culture. Sure. Look, I, I think it's, um, you know, the DNA, it's, it starts from the top, and it is a culture. And again, when you, when, you, when you sit in the chair of putting companies together, separating them, you, you get to see that. You get to see that, because on paper, some things can make sense. But if the people don't want it to happen, it doesn't happen. And what we always say is, you know, the best asset we have leaves, leaves our office every day. You know, and that's our people. And as, in a creative organization, if you don't have people, you know, working together where they can have creative ideas and have that chemistry, that, that doesn't work. But at CBS, the culture is really second place isn't OK. If you're okay, if you're okay, say, hey, we're in second place, that's good. It's probably not an environment for you. It's, you gotta have a little fire in your belly. It gotta make you uneasy. We, we get a report card every single day. We get two report cards, in fact. We get our stock price and we get ratings information. And when those two things are read, nobody feels good. And so it's like, well, what are we doing wrong? How do we, how do, we you know, do better? And so, you know, we're very proud of being the number one network for 12 out of the last 13 years. This is, this is after you. So, <laughs> so 12 out of the last 13 years. Um, and, but, but we're very competitive with NBC. Very competitive with NBC. Um, and so that DNA, it really, it really filters throughout the organization. And so what we want is we want people to, again, strive to be better. Don't just come in and just say, hey, I'm going to phone it in today. I'm going to, you know, going to sit here and I'm looking at the, at the clock and it's almost five o'clock and I can get out of here and I got paid. That's really not what the culture is at CBS. So, so what we want is a collaborative culture which led from the top and you play to win. And we do it fairly. And I think those kind of really get instilled upon you. And, and again, you know, what I always say, what my job really is, is, you know, I hire and fire 
and I allocate capital, right? And then I get out of the way because I gotta let the people do their thing. And so you can't, you can't micromanage creativity. You gotta let it happen and it costs money. And so what you gotta do is we gotta, what I spend the tr time trying to do is pick the best people for that culture that's gonna allow them to succeed because if they succeed, the company succeeds. And if the company succeeds, the shareholders succeed. So I think you gotta have that kind of perspective on it. But again, as you said, you know, Neil, every company is different. And there's no right or wrong to that, to that uh, question. It's just, this is what it, what it is. You mentioned Les Moonves, who um, I, I was telling you backstage yeah. how when I was at NBC, uh, he was at Warner Brothers and he, you know, those were in the must-see TV days on Thursday night at NBC, right. but right. ER right. and Friends were Warner Brothers shows, so yep. he had all the leverage. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've followed what he's yeah. done. He's probably the smartest yeah. guy in the television business. Yep. Present company yes. excluded. Yeah, 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 no, 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 <laughs> um, no, no, no question. But how that. lucky you are to have a mentor like that. We, any of, anybody who has success yes. has found mentors along the way. Absolutely. Uh, so obviously, Les, did you have yeah. other mentors along the way? Yeah, I, yeah look, I, I, again, absolutely. What I would say is, first of all, it, it's, it, for me, it started with my, with my mother. Um, just, just again, probably knowing I wasn't going to be a professional athlete, but saying, go for it. You know, so it was one of those things is, you know, you can always do whatever you want to dream of. It's like, but get an education kind of just in case and knowing that, you know, 99.8% of the people are going to do something other than professional sports. Um, I didn't see it that way at the time. I was like, okay, my mother's supportive of anything I do as long as I got good grades. So it really kind of just stayed, you know, grounded in that. And then along the way from KPMG, you know, to CBS and, and again, even to today to less, you know, you know, our offices are 50 feet from each other, so I get a chance for the last, you know, decade to, uh, you know, see every single day probably the greatest, you know, uh, executive programmer uh, that we've ever seen. Yeah. And so you take away different things from different people. I've had some tough bosses, too. We've had some, you know, bosses you can say, wow. Like, and that makes you a little bit, you know, makes you certainly uneasy, uncomfortable, and stuff like that. But there's a lesson to be learned from that as well. That's like, I don't want to do that. If I ever got in that chair, I would not do that. I would do that, but not that. And I think, again, that helps, you know, frame you. Uh, so you're just taking all of these life experiences and kind of absorbing it and listening. What I always say, when, when, when you're working your way up, listen two-thirds of the time and speak one-third. You're going to be a lot smarter. Just listen to what people are saying, how they're saying what they're doing, and then when you become an child, then you're going to be speaking a lot more than, than listening because, you know, you have to pass that on to what's worked, you know, to the, to the next generation. Anytime you want to teach management, let me know. <laughs> um, uh, but let's turn to the television business sure. and the media sure. business as a whole. Sure. Uh, so you've been at CBS since 1997. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to even begin to list the changes, the change. cable, yeah. satellite, the Netflix. internet, <laughs> Netflix. So, um, how, how has CBS navigated the, those fast-changing waters? Yeah, look, and, and, and you know, we, we've had some moments where it, it's been, you know, certainly challenging uh, as we work through the Great Recession in 08 and 09 and others. But I think for, for, for us, it's stay core to what you do. What we do is produce great content. That's what we do. And so we're not a, a technology company getting from point A to point B. What we do is create or aggregate content that, is want, that, that masses want to consume. And so kind of know what you do, focus. I was like, I, you know, we say, you know, Apple has like the largest market cap, you know, in the, all of their products could fit on one of these tables right here. And you say, no, that's not possible. They're worth how much? They know what they do. And so, so at CBS is what we do is we want to produce must have content, not like to have, must have, must have content. And, and how it get cons consumed has changed a lot and there's been a lot of disruption to the business model, but at the true core of everything we do is that's what we want to do. We're content creators. I want to inform and entertain you and so you come back. And so if I have that, then you'll talk to your friends and however, it used to be the water cooler or the phone and now it's social media and you know the internet. The medium's changed for sure, but if I'm the thing you, if, if our content is the thing you're talking about, we're doing our job right. And then we have to figure out how to monetize that, which is, again, has also changed. But I think that's, it always starts with that core principle. So let's stay on the content uh, issue for a while. So uh, 
in, in, at least in the olden days, broadcast was pretty much about entertainment, sports, and news. Yep. It still is, right? Yep. So, but they each play very different roles. Yes. Talk about the, th the roles of the three different types of content. Yeah, again, so look, we're, we're trying to, again, inform and entertain at the end of the day. You know, there are avid sports fans, so we have to have sports. Not all content is created equal, just like the way you consume it, right? So we think the NFL is the best sports content that's available. It's not to say Major League Baseball or um, uh, the National NBA or NHL or soccer, is, is there anything wrong with those? But for the business model, we think the National Football League is the, the beachfront thing. So we will always stretch to make sure we have those rights. Um, they're 17 weeks in a regular season. They're played on generally Sundays. You know, I know they're expanding a couple of days. But um, so one, the once a week kind of thing. So, so that is always going to be part of the CBS offering. When you see that eye, you know, you know you get sports. You also have the history of news with Walter Cronkite and everything else. And everybody can have all of their their moments with CBS Sports, but we have to kind of, you know, there's truth in reporting. We have to kind of tell you what it is, you know, do our research with it. Again, that, that, that stands for that eye. And then we have to entertain you with our prime time programming to just say, hey, th th this is the stuff that people generally are time shifting. Sports and news, you, ge you generally don't time shift because it's relevant to now. And the other stuff, again, the consumption of that has changed, but still, you know, uh, the Big Bang Theory, NCIS, you know, we have 20 million people come every week to watch those shows. And so that's where they're just, they've had a long day. They want to just lean back. We call it the lean back experience wherever you are and just be entertained for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. And, uh, you know, we feel like that's our obligation to the, to the public. So in the last few years, there's been a huge growth in scripted content and yeah. a lot, lot more lot players more in the game. Yeah. Um, has the, how, how does CBS compete for programming and talent? And is there a content bubble uh, that's yeah. going to burst. Yeah, look, I, I do think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of content that's being produced. Like I said, not all content's created equal. So it's, it's been competitive. It, you know, can it be more competitive? Maybe, but I think it's a little bit of the law of diminishing returns. The, you know, the, the 200th guy in you know, is different than the second guy in. Um, so now others are, are, are doing that. But basically all that is is, right, it's competing for talent. We need talent. We need we need the producer, we need the writer, we need the, the actor, we need all of that stuff. And it doesn't just mean more money makes it better. You can pay people more money, but it's the chemistry that puts it all together that makes the magic. And if you kind of go back and you look in the history of time of how many studios are producing, you probably watch it on a lot of different channels, okay? So you watched Mad Men on AMC and you say, hey, AMC, that's not AMC show. Lionsgate created that. So what you got to do from a business model, you got to go, you got to track back who owns the intellectual property, who has those rights, because those are the people that are going to make more money. And so what we, what our premise is when we're competing with talent, is CBS has the best track record of getting a show into syndication. And so what the, what does that mean? Show into syndication. That means it usually has like 88 episodes, and then you start selling the repeats of the shows, and that's when you'll see. You'll see Big Bang on, on TBS as well as CBS. CBS will have the original and TBS will have. And you know what that means for all of those actors and those writers? They're collecting royalty checks without working. So Jerry Seinfeld today ha hasn't worked on a show. You know, Seinfeld or whatever, or, or Ray Romano for Everybody Loves Raymond or any of their friends. They're still getting paid. Because every time it airs, we're going to mail them a check at the end of the month. And so, so those creative folks, they play for that. That's like hitting a lotto. So that's what they want. So they can do eight episodes of some other show and get paid you know, a little bit of money, and then they gotta go, well, how, how am I gonna pay my bills? So you play to make it to syndication. And so if we give you the best opportunity to make it to syndication, we usually get the A-list folks. And if we get the A-list folks, we get that little edge. Back to what I said, that little edge. I don't know if it's gonna work, but we want to have the best elements together, working together, to give us the best chance for it to work. And, and again, this is where Les is, bar none, the best in the business to do that. I mean, as, as you, you see, all of those guys, you know, he, he put on the screen. And uh, again, it pays over and over and over. But, you know, it is competitive. I, I wished we were a, a monopoly, but uh, it just doesn't work that way. It used to be an oligopoly. It used to be an oligopoly. Yeah, that's changed. <laughs> 
So uh, let's, let's shift a little bit from talking about the content to the changing patterns of distribution. Um, yeah. You know, the, what, in, in the old days, again, yeah. it was a broadcast network distributing right. through affiliated stations all over the country. Yep. You still do. Yep. But then came the cable systems and the yep. stations had to get on the cable system. Sure. Now CBS has an over-the-top offering directly sure. to consumers. Right. How does that play into, how does that affect your relationships with broadcasters yeah. and with cable yeah, systems? Yeah, it, it affects it because you got to, you, you know, every decision we make, there's an economic model behind it and there's implications to folks. So we have to think about those things before we make those. So, you know, we didn't want to come and just say, hey, we're going to go over the top. Technology has allowed consumers to consume it that way. So, I, so what, when, we're, when we're doing an over the top service, we're responding to consumer demand. Consumers, young millennials, are saying, this is the way I want my content. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be stuck in my living room home with a pipe into my house. I want my content on the go with me wherever I want. I've got to pay for that, but I, I, that's the way I want my content. So to me, it's, you know, the consumers have spoken, so we have to satisfy that demand. And so our offering is, is basically to do that. It's to say, hey, listen, you like the library, you like this, we're going to put it all in one bucket. You know, we're going to charge you $5.99 you know, a month. You say, hey, that's great. Because again, that's our intellectual property. We own all of that. You know, the other folks in that chain, from, from creation to consumption, there are a lot of people in the chain that make a little margin along the way. And it impacts those people. So for the affiliates, for instance, on All Access, um, we, um, they're part of that five. They get a piece of that five ninety nine. And so, why? You say, why would you give them a piece? You, you know, you might be a nice guy, but you're not, you know, uh, an idiot. Why would you do that? Well, they have in those local markets where we don't have television stations. They have the live. We, we entered an agreement with them, and they have the the exclusive live linear rights. So live. Not the next day where a lot of people are watching, but they have a live. So they get a piece of it. Mm -hmm. And so what we thought was, is instead of just being total disruptor disruptors, we can bring these folks along. Again, the, the economics change a little bit in that, but it preserves what they do. They're part of the future, and again, we're satisfying that demand. So, so like I said, is you know, what we always have to do is we start with, you know, do we have the content people want? Yes, but they're consuming it different ways now. Okay, so I want to have it here, 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 and here. I don't want to tell you you have to go right here. This is the only way you get it. Well, that might not work for you. So what we say you know, at CBS, I want to give you three C's. I want to give you control. I want to give you convenience. And I want to give you choice. If I give you those three C's, OK, you care least about cost, because that has a lot of value to you. So that incremental two cents, five cents you know, a month, you, know, you say, OK, you absorb that. But when you multiply it times 12, times hundreds of millions, that's a lot of money for us. So, so we're balancing that constantly of just saying, you know, what is the price point, but satisfy that demand. But I, I presume the cable industry was pretty resistant to this yeah. idea. Um, how, how, did you, how did you negotiate that, and how did you keep peace with the cable industry? Yeah, look, I think the cable industry you know, is, uh, is evolving now. I think you're seeing the traditional Comcast of the world, uh, DISH uh, for those satellite companies. They're having these broadband packages. It's really just broadband. It's, it's content out of the home and stuff. So, so what we did is you know, we, we preserved those rights. So now I think, again, you, know, you want to talk about oligopolies or regional monopolies, the, the, the traditional cable system, there was only one way for you to get it. If you were in a cable vision home here in New York, that was your only choice. You had to get it through there. Right? Now you have choice. And so they're evolving, and now so they're going to have their own packages that do it. So again, it wasn't they didn't they didn't they didn't want this to occur. Um, uh, but you know, when I say when you see that Netflix has evolved to a forty-five billion dollar company, and you say, well, okay, what is Netflix? Netflix started as a as a as a DVD rental you know business. And as they were you know, renting the business, they said, well, we don't have to ship the DVD. You can just kind of do it you know, um, uh, you know, without, without doing it. We, we'll keep it in the cloud. And they said, they came to all of the content providers and said, well, we'll buy all your repeats of, of shows. I was like, you know, that was pretty disruptive. So we went to the cable operators and said, do you guys want to buy these? Because you know, they don't have a lot of value. Why, why would you want to buy that? And I was like, OK, well, we're going to sell it. 
and we sell it to, we sell each content you know company sells it to Netflix. Netflix has 40 million subscribers, paying you know now going to be 10 bucks a month or it was eight you know a little while ago, eight bucks a month. And to me, that that revenue should have been going to the distributors. You know, if they would just would have paid for the content, but you know they didn't innovate. They didn't innovate because they didn't see the demand that was coming that just said consumers want this. And that, that will get startup companies going and creating a lot of value. So that's what I would say. It's always going to be competitive. If you're unwilling to change, somebody's in, in a garage figuring it out. You know, and, and again, that keeps every, the whole process honest, just like it's competitive for you know, content. Mm -hmm. Um, it's now competitive on the distributions, which is good news for us because now we can sell it to multiple, you know, players. We're not, we're not tethered to, in New York, it's got to be Cablevision. Yeah, I know it's a powerful, it's much more complex. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, management yeah, challenge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's, there's a lot of opportunity there. So let's, let's go back to people who are trying to start their career. Let's, let's, let's mm -hmm. take it from their perspective a little bit. Right. So uh, I assume most of the students who are here have some interest in the business. Yeah. They, they're thinking about how do I launch a career in that business. Right. What kind of advice do you have for, for people who are thinking about that? Yeah, look, like, like I said, I mm -hmm. think it's, um, you know, if, if media is your thing and you're, you're attracted to it, it gets you kind of up and you have a point of view on it, you know, spend time and try, try to get in, a, in the door somewhere. Don't worry about the title. Don't even worry about the money. Just get in the door. Because, again, it's always, I would always promote from within first. I want to reward loyalty first. So if you're within CBS, it's much easier to move up the ranks than come outside. So try to get in the door. You know, so if, if, and if you hear no, that's okay. That doesn't mean no forever. It's just not now. And so I think you have to have that persistence, again, that fire in the belly to just say, I'm going to keep trying. You will get that opportunity. It just may not come on the first time you knock on that door. I know there's a, uh, just a few more minutes, and I do want to do it. Um, I, I would like to open it up to Q&A, just if there's any questions for, you know, for the audience, you know, just so you guys have time to ask me some questions, and I'll be as candid you know, as I can with you guys. Uh, you know about anything you want to ask about. It's all, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all good. Because I was in your chair. Yeah, we just have a few minutes, so take advantage of this opportunity. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Um, as you were transitioning in your career, yep. What was the most difficult challenge that you had to face? Yeah, you know, the most difficult challenge was 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 in my mind that you know I I, I wasn't prepared for the next job I had. I felt inadequate in that. It was like, you know, again, I was, I'm a, I was a 40-something year old uh, chief financial officer who had never been a chief financial officer for a $25 billion company. You know, I was a little, I was a little intimidated by that in my mind. I certainly had the capabilities and, 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 you know, the confidence in myself. But, you know, I was like, can I do this? You know, and I had that. And the people around me, back to Leslie, had more confidence in me than I had in myself. And so, you know, you need that around you because you're going to have those moments and just saying, uh, you know, am I in over my head here? And then the more you do it, you're like, oh, no, I'm onto something here. And it builds and it builds and it builds. So that's what I always say. It's, again, it, you, can, you can translate that into anything. It's okay to be a little uneasy in your stomach at, when you go home at night and put your head on your pillow and you say, did I make the right decision? Was that right? And that, did I do enough? That's okay. Because if you're thinking that way, my guess is the answer is yes. Yep. Uh, how did you get your first internship and what was it? I internship? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll give you my first intern. My first intern, I worked for Metro North. And uh, in, in the internal audit department, and here was my job. This is, this is true. I had to ride the trains. I would, I would wear a baseball cap and plain clothes. I would ride the trains. This is, my, this is my first internship. I would ride the trains during peak hours. And when the conductors would come by, if they stamped non-peak and then they charged me peak hours, they were pocketing the money. The, the delta, because you would say off-peak, so you're only supposed to spend $5. Peak, you have to spend $9. And I would ride the train and sit every day, go back and forth and watch them and see if they were doing it. That was my first job at Metro North, whatever. It was just like, I felt like a police officer. I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do if he stamps it? It was like, I'm going to run back, you know, mommy, daddy, he said this, whatever. But it was, uh, again, I spent a lot of time traveling on Metro North. <laughs>
you know, see, you, I mean, again, it just goes to show you as an example, you know, of, of what that was. And it, while I was in college, you know, before that, I was, you know, working at the Carnegie Deli as an expediter saying, you know, 86 on the brisket. You know, so it's just kind of where you kind of get that kind of level. But again, every single one of those, there's a, t there's a lesson to be learned and a takeaway. You know, that old saying is youth is wasted on the young. You know, there's so many lessons that I was like, wow, was like, and you put it into context as you get a little older, but just absorb it and just believe me, it's having an impact on you every single one of those jobs. It's a question in the back. What do you think the future of content distribution is going to be with the rise of Netflix, YouTube yeah. becoming much bigger every single day? So what do you think the future holds for like, cable companies and networks like yeah. CBS and NBC? For, first of all, I think everybody is going to be fine. Okay, every, there, there's, there's an, every, all these companies you just mentioned make enough profit that they're going to be fine. You know, it may go up or down, you know, as investors, the margins may change a little bit, but this isn't something I think anybody goes bankrupt. Um, um, but the consumption, where I think this is going to go is I think there's going to be less, there's going to be less choice and the consumer is going to end up paying a little bit more. And so that doesn't sound great. But there's going to be, whether it's Apple, Amazon, the traditional guys, there's going to be a package of, 20 or so channels that's going to cost a consumer 40, 50 bucks instead of you know, 80 or 90 for the cable bill. And you're going to take that content with you wherever you go. And I think that has got millions of subscribers waiting to happen. And there will be a few that will get that right, and there will be some that won't get that right. But I just think just by all of our market research of what consumers want, they love the catch up ability, you know, um, the ad model, the advertising model may change a little bit. And so that's all figure out into that business model of what is the right price point that you have to pay. You know, there are a lot of people who say, hey, I don't want any ads. Okay, we can take out the ads. I mean, Hulu now does that, right? $8 ads, $12 no ads. I mean, you're basically paying, the ads are subsidizing what you're paying for. So if you, you know, if you don't want to, if you want to save four bucks, watch the ad. If you, if you don't want to, you can pay for it. So basically what they're saying is the ads are worth $4 a subscriber. And so, again, every decision is there, but all we're doing is satisfying that demand. And I just think, again, if I'm watching the way my kids consume media and stuff like that, they just want it into a little bit shorter form and to travel on the go with them. We have time for one more question. Who's the lucky winner? <laughs> we covered everything? Oh, right here. Okay. <clears throat> Say again? Mm -hmm. Carnegie Deli, I really oh. like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was like that, but, uh, what would you say was like your biggest failure as, like during your job where you really just sat down and just was like, oh my God, like where that really unjust feeling that you have in this case? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna give you one that just sticks out that I think is uh, it was I wasn't working, it, it was it, it was pace. It was pace. I went I went to pace to play baseball. I was a much better baseball player than I was um, uh, a football player. And uh, when I went there, I played second base and short, shortstop. And, there, and, and I, I was like an all city you know, uh, player, and I could have gone to the University of Miami. I was going to, uh, big schools were recruiting me. This is where my mother said, listen, if you're good, you're still going to get drafted. Just uh, stay local, do this, whatever. So I, I, I listened. So I went in, I, I, you know, I, I, I thought I was pretty good. And when I got there, it was Division One. I. I think Pace is now Division Two. It was Division One, and I wasn't that good. <laughs> but in my mind, I was that good. And the coach said, "Well, you know, I have you, you come in the in the fall, and then and then you play in the spring." And he said, um, "I'm going to take you off the roster for the fall, but come back in the spring because I want to give the shortstop and second baseman playing time because they're seniors, and they're going to get drafted. So you know, you're not going to play. So I'm going to kind of like." I don't want to say red shirt you, but just you know, come back in the spring. That was the speech I got. And back to what I said earlier, I never heard no before in, in sports. In football or baseball, I never heard no. And I went back to my room, I cried, I called my mother, and I quit. And to this day, I'm not a quitter. So I took that lesson, I said, I will never, I will never quit again. I'll get knocked down. You will beat me, but I will never quit. And that to me is the most important lesson that I, because that's just not who I was, and I don't know why I did that. And I think it was maybe I just was a little scared. 
and stuff. And but again, the lesson for me was back now to business. I will never quit in business. That I will never go through that again. Because again, I regret that to this day. Well, it's clearly it's clear to everybody, I'm sure, how smart Joe is and how experienced and accomplished he is. I think now it's also pretty clear to you that he's pretty high on the likability uh, scale <laughs> as well, uh, which is really critical to success as well. So let's let's give Joe a warm thank you. Thank you.